Welcome to the show. I'm your host, Ellie in Space, and this is your Space News Roundup. Shuttle has cleared the tower. Unfortunately, the highly anticipated Virgin Orbit launch that we were all looking forward to, many of us were watching it live, was not successful and did not reach orbit. This was the first attempt to launch from Western Europe, and it appears it has failed after an anomaly was reported to have prevented the rocket from reaching orbit. Virgin Orbit was attempting to send nine small satellites into space from a 70-foot rocket attached beneath the wing of a modified Boeing 747 aircraft. Cosmic Girl took off from New Key around 10 p.m. Monday night, and remember, the rocket had to detach from the aircraft and ignite over the Atlantic Ocean at an altitude of 35,000 feet. This would happen about an hour and 20 minutes after the launch. So the launch was successful. We learned later, however, that Virgin Orbit said there had been an anomaly that prevented them from reaching orbit, and they said they would provide more information when they could. The UK space industry employs 47,000 people, but while the country is second to only the United States in the number of satellites it produces, the UK has been waiting to have their own satellites sent into orbit via their own spaceports. Now, Cosmic Girl made it home safely to New Key, and of course, this was a major blow to everyone who was watching the stream, everyone who was there in person. In fact, over 2,000 space fans were watching this uh, from the ground in New Key, including angry astronaut, my friend Jordan. So I was watching his stream. He gave me a shout out. Ellie, is Ellie in the house? We got Ellie here right now. Um, that'd be fantastic if, if Ellie is indeed here. Welcome. And also Ellie in space, make sure that you subscribe to Ellie in space. Fantastic channel, fantastic channel. I do, um, I do cooperative podcasts with her, um, on a regular basis. Wonderful, wonderful lady, wonderful channel. Steven, thank you so much for the fiver. Really do appreciate it. Yeah. I am proud, but it's all because of you guys. Let me tell you, Ellie, thank you so much. Really do appreciate it. I would love to co-host a live stream in Europe. Come on over. I, I'm, I'm ready to, to, to do it tomorrow if you want to come over. No problem at all. Really do appreciate that. So thank you very much for that shout out. And, you know, you provided some great coverage and we're so sorry that it didn't work out. But as we know, space is hard. I will say I was really inspired by watching Angry's live stream. I mean, the fact that he's over there in Europe, he had someone helping him run the stream. Uh, presumably he had a camera person with him. If he didn't, he did a great job. But I want to know if I ran a similar stream, let's say, I don't know, for like the first Starship orbital launch would that be something that you guys would be interested in watching? I would love to get a team together to kind of help me operate a live, uh, you know, reaction to the Starship orbital flight. So if that's something you guys would be interested in watching, let me know. I know that there are some uh, much more professional streams. And what I mean by that is with better equipment where this is their full-time job, but I would like to provide kind of a human interest element of things. So perhaps um, if that's something you're interested in, let me know because I need to start brainstorming now because that brings me into our next topic. That Starship orbital flight could be pretty soon. When hop Starship well, we're getting so much closer because look at this video SpaceX tweeted, Ship 24 is stacked on Super Heavy Booster 7 at Starbase and we're getting excited for the orbital launch. We are, of course, waiting for the Starship booster to complete some of their most challenging tests that SpaceX will ever put it through at Starbase. Super Heavy Booster 7 could soon attempt a full static fire test of all 33 of its Raptor 2 engines. Now, if everything goes according to plan, Elon Musk says that late February or early March is really looking likely. And I wanted to address this because I saw a let's say not credible news outlet put out there that the date is now January 31st and 
that just seems highly unlikely, you know, especially with the license still not being granted yet and the test still not being complete. So it's a little bit frustrating when you see these uh, articles pop up, you know, specifying a date when that is just not true. So keep that in mind if you see a date, because I know people on the inside and we really don't have a firm date yet but Elon did address this in a recent tweet, and I think that late February or early March does sound more feasible, so um, I guess we'll, you know, keep an eye on it, but I, late January just, no, that's, I'm gonna say it here, I don't think it's gonna be late January. Blue Origin once again proves to be mysterious after they posted a job opening for their Blue Ring project and then took that listing down, but we did gather some details from that listing. Blue Origin posted a position for Blue Ring Senior Program Manager. This was on the Workday Careers page. It was taken down less than a day later. We can speculate and say maybe this is because Blue Origin doesn't want us, the public, to know about what's going on with this Blue Ring project, but Ars Technica did a great report on this and they've tried to extrapolate some details from that job posting, including that as the program manager, you will lead the development, manufacturing, and operations of a multi-mission, multi-orbit platform. Some other clues that Eric Berger touched on from the Ars Techna article about this position in the job posting include the following statement. Now, this is how the job supports Blue Origin's vision of millions of people living and working in space to benefit Earth. Quote, enabling this feature requires frequent and affordable access to a variety of orbits, as well as ability to access infrastructure and services in those orbits. There is a crucial need for rideshare and hosting solutions for small satellites for commercial and government purposes. Blue Ring is reported to be one of the projects being worked on at Blue Origin as part of the company's advanced development programs. Some people say that SpaceX is tight-lipped. So if SpaceX is tight-lipped, then Blue Origin, I guess, is completely mute because it is very hard to get any details. You can't even really park on the side of the road to kind of see their facility in Florida. There's blue cones. You're just not allowed. So uh, in time, we'll learn more about Blue Ring. But for now, there was a job posting. It is no longer active. Maybe it'll be active again soon. As many of you know, I was just in Las Vegas for the Consumer Electronics Show, CES 2023. This was my first time going to CES. And not only did I have a great time, but I noticed this kind of theme of space, which surprised me. Uh, this is a show that my dad has been going to for over 30 years now. It was my first time going to the show. And I, I wasn't sure how much space-related stuff would be there, but I was able to find a couple space-related things. Actually, there were there were more, there just wasn't enough time. So for example, one thing that uh, surprised me is during the Sony presentation, the first announcement uh, that was made about Starsphere. Sony will launch services that connect users with space through the world's first satellite operating experience. So basically they have a Starsphere satellite and it's special because you can operate it yourself. You can shoot your own space photography and videography with exclusive camera work, including never before possible angles of view. Sony says the hope is you will get life-changing space perspectives through the experience of connecting with space. These are never before seen services. Currently those services will only be offered in Japan and the United States, uh, and they're not quite up and running yet. In fact, they recently just launched that satellite on a SpaceX Falcon 9 rocket, uh, but that was really cool to see. Not only that, I went to a seminar called Meals on Mars, the race to create food and space. And we learned about a 3D printing company. They're gonna try to turn plastic into edible material, right? Because when you think of these deep space missions, you want to have a way to create food. So it sounds like uh, we're serving dual purposes here when we're talking about space food. It's not just about feeding people as they go to Mars or Moon. It's about how do we find ways to feed people in scenarios where resources are constrained, disaster strikes here. I mean, Hiro, would you agree with that? Uh, yes, I, I think that, that your purpose is uh, quite important in, in terms of not only so uh, develop sort of solutions, but uh, sort of a business viability point of view. Time is running out to become a Kerbal Space Program player 
for free. You heard me. And maybe you watched my live stream with Marcus House. He gave me a little lesson in Kerbal Space Program, and I did a lot better with his help. But Epic Games, which is a major player in online game sales, gives away a game every week of the year. So this week's game is Kerbal Space Program. Of course, this is a very popular space launch simulator. Scott Manley and Marcus House would credit Kerbal Space Program with the success of their channels. Uh, this is a great time for you and your squadrons to get free site licenses. So I wanted to let you know about this. I will link this offer in the description. Again, I'm not affiliated with them. I just know that many of you wanted to play KSP. It is a little bit expensive. So go get it now. It is free until January 12th. So time is running out. And to go back to CES for a second, I interviewed Sandy Monroe, the Teardown Titan. Hey guys, it's Ellie in Space. I'm here at CES and I'm joined by Sandy Monroe. And Sandy, I wanted to get your thoughts on CES so far. Sandy, why are you such a stiff? Oh well, maybe we'll hear more from him later. So I'm so excited to share that interview with you. <clears throat> and you may be wondering, well, Ellie, you're Ellie in space. Why do we care about Sandy Monroe? Well, number one, you should because he's really interesting and a funny guy and also extremely knowledgeable about cars, but he also has some history in the space industry. And I wanted to share some of that with you guys in my interview with him. So hopefully you enjoy that. I had a great time talking to him. And in fact, my camera died uh, while talking to him. So I would have talked to him longer, but that is uh, just one of the joys of being a solo reporter in the field. Also, another notice for you, please watch my space panel if you haven't already. Here's a, a preview of that. Uh, I want to go to a question from one of my Patreon subscribers, Scott Walter. He wants to know, what does the public misunderstand about spaceflight? And maybe, Anne, we can start with you. Oh, wow. Wow. Um... Well, it's, it's kind of what we've already talked about, Ellie. I think they misunderstand how hard it still is. I mean, yeah. you think after we'd been do doing this for 60, 70 years that it would get easier and more routine and less likely to fail, but we're, we're still learning about the technology. And the physics for space launch is so unforgiving that I think people misunderstand that a lot. Uh, they don't understand why we fail so often, and I, I totally get that. Um, when I look at, you know, a car on the street, the chance of that failing on a random drive to the, to the grocery store is really small. And yet with rockets, the chance of failure is still pretty high. So I think that's, you know, that's one area where I think that people just don't quite get how challenging it still is to get anything into orbit. And what a setback it is if something does go catastrophically wrong. I mean, you've experienced that firsthand. Talk about mm -hmm. how you know, how much that really does set the whole process back. Yeah, it does in a number of ways. It, it's actually, failures in rocket launch are both good and bad. On the one hand, they're generally bad for the whole industry because we want to be getting to a more reliable place where you can count on it and you don't see the failures so often. But at the same time, new companies uh, or, or even existing companies that have been around for a long time, when they have a failure, they're learning about their vehicle and they're, they're pushing the technology further. And so that's, that's the sort of the positive aspect of having a failure. Scott, do you have any additional thoughts on, you know, public misunderstanding? Well, space yeah, I mean, I was gonna sort of say you, you kind of Got it right there. I think that I like to say that rocket science conceptually in its sort of abstract thing is actually not that difficult. There's a, mm -hmm. you know, but it's the rocket engineering yeah. where the margins between building your thing and having enough safety margin, they're very, very tight because you want to make your vehicle light. You're trying to work within constraints that are just difficult. So it's not that this in rocket science is hard. It's that rocket engineering is unforgiving. That's right? exactly right. Right. Yeah. I mean, and uh, so, yeah, I think, uh, you know, the thing that I'll say that I didn't understand was actually just how easy it is to do the navigation for getting into orbit by hand and how mm -hmm. difficult it is to actually do it for real when you have, you know, actual, uh, you know, sensors and, you know, uh, 
navigation hardware, integrating all that stuff without with imperfect information. Uh, you know, there's a lot of things that people have learned from Kerbal Space Program, which are not really representative of reality because they have perfect, pristine uh, data available, which isn't what you have in the real world. Yeah. Right. This was a live stream I did, and I was joined by Zach Golden with CSI Starbase, Scott Manley, of course, many of you probably know who he is, and Ann Chinnery, who was one of the first SpaceX employees. This was a great panel. I wanted to have a few others, but they weren't able to join, so I would like to do more of these kind of group live streams in the future. Um, I really enjoy live streams. Sometimes I get a little bit nervous in live streams, which may be hard for you to believe because I did TV news for almost 10 years. Um, but they're good practice for me. They're good uh, interaction with you guys. And so um, hopefully I'll be able to do one of those soon with the people that couldn't show up like angry astronaut like Tim Dodd, who were interested um, and Marcus House. So I just wanted to let you guys know about that because maybe you missed it live, but it is still a great conversation that we had. And there will just be many more to come. So thank you so much. If you've made it all the way to the end of this video, you get extra bonus points. And I just really appreciate all the support for the channel. 2023 is the year for alien space. It's the year for space in general, but I really feel like we're, we're just about to break through and uh, really have a lot of traction on this channel. So it's really exciting for me. And I'm just so thankful to every single one of you who keeps coming back for more space news. Oh, no. Okay. In case you were wondering why I climb under the desk here, it's because I share this space with my mother and uh, there's not enough room. Anyway, all right, <clears throat> let's do this. Three, two, one. Welcome to this. <laughs>